Thank you very much for joining us, comrades. Um, it's the first time we've tried a Saturday evening meeting. It does, uh, numbers are a bit down, but they might pick up. We've shared it in a few groups now. Um, it's actually, as it turned out, perfect timing. I mean, we planned this about 10 days ago, and as it happens, now we have the results, so we can actually make a, have a more informed uh, session than we uh, might have had a couple of days ago. So this is a highly contentious, interesting subject, obviously. Um, it looks very much as if Joe Biden uh, has won, and we can almost hear the collective sigh of relief from the mainstream media and establishment uh, figures. Um, so there's lots of questions around that issue to discuss tonight. Is it back to normal now for capitalism after the Trump wilderness years? Um, and just like it would be silly to dismiss Boris Johnson just simply as a buffoon, which uh, of no doubt he is, it would be silly to see Donald Trump, in my view, merely as a, as a nut job that wouldn't have explained how he could have won the presidency. He did manage to connect to a lot of working class people, um, many of whom were thoroughly alienated by capitalism or the, the elite, um, despite him being perhaps the prime example of, of what's wrong with capitalists and capitalism. And um, from our perspectives, at least or from my perspective, it looks as if these a lot of people that he uh, managed to uh, bring up behind him are the kind of people that actually we should connect with as socialists and should offer hope with the socialist program. Why, why, why couldn't we? Or why? What's what's holding us up? And what what does a Biden presidency now mean for the working class and the way the USA pursues its foreign interests? Then there's the question of of Biden's politics. Um, somebody just commented CNA as a saying, luckily there's no socialism in Joe Biden. And I think they're right there. But there's the question of Kamala Harris, which has been portrayed as a uh, left-wing, hard left infiltrator. And she might, so we've been warned, um, well become president if Biden dies and he's half dead already, some, some seem to be saying. Another question is, of course, what will Trump do? And what will his supporters do? Many of them with weapons, etc. Is it? Is there really a chance of a, of a kind of civil war on the cards? Um, so it's a really volatile situation, despite, um, you know, it seems very relatively clear cut now. So as always in this, in our sessions, we welcome and value questions and contributions from the audience. Um, the introductions will be by two left-wing commentators and activists. Um, Daniel Lazar is going to start, he lives in New York. He's a Trotskyist, journalist, and author of three books on the US Constitution and politics. Uh, Steve Seltz is a filmmaker who lives in San Francisco, produces a weekly show on, on radio, etc. We're putting all the links um, out when we put out the video, and it's on our website as well. And he's involved in the United Front Committee for a Labour Party, which is an interesting question. Where is the working class uh, in, in America? So very um, glad to welcome you both. Um, Dan is going to start for about 20 minutes and then Steve 20 minutes, then we're opening up. Um, Steve has to go at in about uh, an hour and 10 minutes because he's um, in a, uh, going to a demonstration. So we have to, if you have questions at him uh, for him, we're gonna um, bring them in first perhaps. So first, um, Dan, please, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Um, so uh, uh, CNN, the, uh, the cable news network uh, announced the results about an hour ago. Uh, I'm in Manhattan, and there was about a good 45 minutes of solid cheering and uh, and horn honking, honking, uh, and uh, other stuff. And um, there seems to be a real air of jubilation. Uh, now, of course, um, uh, I think I'll I'll discuss the uh, what Biden achieved, his gains, and then we'll discuss the uh, the more problematic uh, aspects of the election. And then I'll let Steve uh, fill in whatever I didn't. Uh, I didn't cover. Um, so, uh, so Biden um, did better than I thought he would actually. Uh, he, uh, he won the popular vote by about uh, 6%, which was uh, significantly better than, uh, than Hillary Clinton's margin of 4.5% uh, in 2016. Uh, he, of course, we have this crazy electoral college system uh, and in 2016, uh, produced an upset by going against Hillary uh, Clinton, but this time uh, it followed the uh, the popular vote. Um, so instead of having uh, upsets the way we had in 2016 and 2000, uh, this was more of a normal election. Um, uh, 
So Biden, I guess, deserves credit for that. Uh, I found him to be a, a terrible campaigner, uh, absolutely atrocious, uh, committing gaffes. Uh, he, uh, uh, right and left, uh, he lies all the time. For example, he, uh, he, um, uh, he's, his attitude to the truth is every bit as tangential as Trump's as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, he's the kind of guy who uh, who loses his train of thought mid sentence, and therefore his uh, his his speeches tend to sort of dissolve into sort of like you know crazy aimless um, uh, um, word salads, as, as the term that's been been called. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it was enough to, to prevail against Trump, and Trump is a uh, is extraordinarily unpopular uh, in certain quarters. Um, other Republican candidates for Congress actually outperformed Trump. So apparently some portion of the electorate for Democrat, for Republican candidates for Congress, but voted against Trump because they just find him to be personally so reprehensible, um, which is really interesting in my book. Um, but what Biden didn't accomplish, uh, first of all, the Democrats actually lost seats in the House of Representatives, um, they, which is a, a big disappointment to them. Uh, it's unclear because there will be a special election in a few weeks, but um, it doesn't appear that they, they captured the Senate, which means the Senate is still in Republican hands. Uh, and of course, the Supreme Court is, uh, is, is solidly in Republican hands. Um, so uh, it would appear that a Biden uh, administration will be uh, checkmated or checked um, from the start. They'll, it'll face a hostile Republican-controlled uh, Senate and Supreme Court, uh, and therefore its maneuvering ability will be uh, extremely limited. Um, by the way, uh, Trump has not conceded uh, clearly. In fact, quite to the contrary, on Wednesday, evening, he gave a speech, I think it was Wednesday, maybe it was Thursday, um, in which he was, uh, he gave a speech uh, filled with defiance, uh, in which he accused the, uh, the Democrats of stealing the election um, and, uh, and vowed to fight uh, the ostensible results uh, tooth and nail. Um, uh, he could do that. Um, the odds would appear to be against him. He would have to sort of stage rebellions in um, probably three or four states. Uh, now, the way that works is that we have state legislatures, and the state and, and most states are actually controlled by Republicans. And conceivably, this is a long shot. This would be a a uh, a intensely controversial move, uh, but conceivably. Republican-controlled legislators, legislatures in some of the states which are uh, contested, could actually reject the uh, the vote tallies and um, actually uh, uh, allocate their their um, uh, their electoral votes to Trump. Uh, this has been floated over the last couple of days uh, by Republicans. Uh, as I said, it would require, uh, it would be an extraordinarily uh, brazen and radical move. Um, but their hope would be to, uh, to throw the election into the House of Representatives where, um, uh, where the, uh, the it's, it's according to the very strange rules in the US Constitution, uh, the representatives would vote according to state delegations and where Republicans therefore actually have, even though they, they're a minority in the House, they actually have the majority of state delegations and conceivably they could th still throw the election to Trump. So it's not quite over, but I must stress that this, is a, this strikes me as a real long shot. Uh, Trump would have to have a well-oiled machine in a number of different uh, states. Uh, the uproar would be, uh, would be overwhelming. Um, it's, uh, it re would require intense party discipline on the part of the Republicans to pull this off. I'm not really sure if he could do it, but we'll know more in the next few days. I can't dismiss the possibility um, outright, but I think it is extremely unlikely. Um, so it looks like uh, Joe Biden is America's next president.
domestically, if he does face a hostile Senate and a hostile Supreme Court, uh, what it means is he will get very little, very little done. Uh, he will be blocked every step of the way by, um, by Republicans who are out to, to kneecap his administration from the start to do to him what the Democrats did to Trump uh, starting in early 17, where they paralyzed his administration for uh, two or three years over the Russia gate issue, the issue of, of collusion, Russian collusion, uh, which of course turned out to be phony uh, from top to bottom. But, um, but, but re Republicans will very likely try a similar gambit, uh, very likely around the question of, uh, of Biden and his son's son Hunter's um, uh, business activities and attempt to, uh, to make money off the family name. Uh, so we could probably look to more bitter infighting uh, in, in January, more, uh, more uh, warfare on Capitol Hill, uh, more political immobilization, uh, and more, um, more of a non-shooting civil war uh, between the various branches of the, uh, of the uh, federal government. Um, so in terms of a program, uh, Biden will have um, little power to really make any major changes. Um, even on the COVID-19 front, um, he's likely to be very ineffectual. Uh, the, the new figures for the uh, for the disease show that the uh, that there are now uh, I think it's 139,000 new cases per day. Uh, this is nearly double the previous peak in July. So the disease is raging out of control. Um, the Trump administration has given up fighting it. I presume that Trump will do nothing in, over the next two months that he remains in office before the uh, before the inauguration. So essentially the federal government will be totally immobilized uh, or when it comes to the uh, disease. Um, uh, but even when Biden gets in, he will face a host of um, recalcitrant Republican governors who will, impose, who will oppose any attempts to say, impose a nationwide mask uh, mandate uh, or any way to try to uh, uh, create a concerted national program uh, aimed at combating the disease. So, so Biden will face an uphill battle there, which means that America should, will, America's prospects in the face of the uh, epidemic uh, look, um, are already very grim and uh, do not look uh, likely to turn around uh, under Biden. Um, under Biden's economic program, uh, he has pledged to, uh, to spend more money for, uh, for um, uh, epidemic relief. Uh, as to whether he'll do that, that's also highly dubious. Uh, we have no idea what the direction uh, the, the uh, economy, economy will take in, uh, in, in January. My guess is it will not be in very good shape. Uh, it'll be plunging downwards. Uh, and therefore Biden will have very little maneuvering room. Uh, and US debt levels uh, are climbing uh, extremely high. I think that the, uh, the, the currently, uh, uh, the federal debt level I think is currently 125% of GDP and, uh, and really he heading into serious Italian style danger zones. So I would expect uh, Biden to be, a, to be a president of austerity and he hoped that he will introduce a green new deal, I think, are highly is highly uh, unlikely to, to be uh, fulfilled. Um, uh, so I uh, I am extremely pessimistic about what a Biden uh, administration will bring. Um, on the foreign policy front, uh, this is really interesting. Um, remember, uh, uh, Trump ran in two thousand sixteen. Um, as a, in a really curious way, as a kind of a, 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 a slightly uh, uh, peacenik opponent of uh, Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton, of course, is a, was an arch militarist. There had been no uh, military adventure that the US was involved in uh, from the 1980s on that she did not endorse. That goes with the, uh, the, the aiding of the Contras, uh, where Bill Clinton um, actually uh, was uh, quite cooperative with the, uh, the, the Reagan administration at, at that time and using Arkansas, using the Arkansas National Guard. 
uh, in an attempt to, uh, to to channel aid to the Contras, and there were all kinds of rumors about uh, about um, uh, airports in Arkansas being used actually to to fly uh, material to the uh, Contras in Nicaragua. Um, and of course, Hillary Clinton backed the invasion of Iraq, the invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, she was a prime uh, architect of the uh, of NATO intervention in Libya. She devoted uh, uh, probably three weeks in late March and early April uh, 2011 into personally recruiting the uh, Qatar to join the uh, anti-Gaddafi uh, um, uh, uh, effort with the result that Qatar injected somewhere around half a billion dollars into the uh, ranks of the, uh, of the Libyan Mujahideen, the uh, Libyan Wahhabists who, uh, who, were, who were reducing that country to, uh, to, to chaos. And it still, of course, is, is chaotic. Uh, Clinton was a major architect of a US, British, and French intervention in, uh, in Syria. Uh, and uh, Obama, under um, uh, with, uh, of course, uh, Biden at his side, also greenlit the, uh, uh, the Saudi war against, uh, against Yemen, one of the most uh, brutal imperialist, imperialist wars we've, uh, we've seen in, in decades. Um, so, um, uh, so, so the um, uh, uh, Trump, in opposing these adventures, actually, sort of kind of ironically ran to the left of Hillary Clinton. Uh, and so I expect, I fully expect uh, Biden, Biden to sort of turn the pendulum back to that, uh, that um, the, those, the, the, the Obama, the Obama, uh, Clinton, uh, John Kerry policies of 2008 to 2016. Uh, and I think that we'll see a much more, uh, uh, a return to a much more muscular uh, US foreign policy. Um, that means uh, that uh, where Trump uh, was skeptical of NATO, uh, I think that Biden will uh, move very quickly to repair relations with NATO um, and to use, use his powers to strengthen the, uh, strengthen the alliance. I expect that, uh, that, that, uh, that Biden will try to talk tough with Russia. Um, uh, he has already indicated that he, uh, he, um, he backs the, uh, the, the, the Belarusian uh, revolution, uh, and that he wishes uh, Trump would be more interventionist as an, in an attempt to uh, rein in Russian power. Um, uh, I don't know what he would do with regard to uh, Azerbaijan and, Ar and Armenia. The situation there is fast deteriorating, so it may be a fait accompli by the time he takes, uh, he takes office. Um, uh, and I figure that in the Ukraine, uh, he will definitely increase uh, aid for the Kiev government uh, and in general promote a more confrontationalist attitude with uh, pro-Russian separatist rebels in, the, uh, in eastern Ukraine. And of course, we'll, uh, we'll step up the confrontation over uh, Crimea. Um, so I, I see foreign policy actually going to the right under Biden, um, even as it, uh, it goes uh, slightly to the left a micro step to the left in terms of uh, domestic policy. Um, for the uh, for uh, British, the, all the British people taking part in this uh, this seminar, um, uh, I think that uh, that Biden will be um, uh, will be pro EU when it comes to the Brexit negotiations. Uh, although those will be completed by the time he takes office, uh, he is not a friend of Boris Johnson the way that uh, that Trump was. Uh, he has already made a made um, uh, comments, noises about uh, Johnson's uh, uh, um, threats to uh, overthrow the, uh, the uh, peace agreement in, uh, in Northern Ireland by reimposing a hard border. Uh, the US was very heavily invested in, the, uh, in, that, in, that, in those peace negotiations back in the 1990s. Uh, and Biden has made it very clear that he would be very upset at anything which, uh, which, which turned back the clock on those, uh, those negotiations. So I figure that, um, that Boris Johnson will probably face a, a bit more static from Washington, uh, thanks to, uh, to Biden taking office and thanks to Biden's uh, pro-EU stance. Um, I think those will be, I think that in general, I think that what we'll see is a, uh, an attempted return to, uh, to more uh, 
to more normal imperial relations. Uh, that is that the uh, that Biden will make all the uh, the usual sounds about the uh, rule of law internationally. He will be more respectful of uh, international uh, uh, um, institutions and agencies, whereas Trump, of course, is just like you know, completely contemptuous. Um, and uh, um, I think that America, U.S. allies in, in Europe uh, will breathe a sigh of relief, uh, especially France, Germany, uh, most particularly. Uh, I th I'm sure that that Biden will do nothing to uh, to uh, disrupt relations with what um, Donald Rumsfeld used to call New Europe, i.e., uh, uh, Eastern Europe and the Baltics. Uh, I'm sure that the, uh, the US orientation to those countries uh, um, will uh, continue, which because I think, I, I, as I said before, I think Biden to be very, I expect Biden to be a more confrontationalist with, uh, with Russia and therefore will try to, uh, to increase military investment in Poland and uh, other nearby countries. Um, one last question involves Iran. Uh, um, Biden has pledged to join the, uh, the to rejoin the uh, the JCPOA, the 2015 nuclear accord. Um, but I'm I'm willing to bet he never does it. Uh, the reason is that U.S. allies, Israel, primarily Israel, uh, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE would scream bloody murder if he did. Um, and they they have they have great deal of power in the uh, in Washington. And uh, Biden is a as you know everyone knows Biden is a uh, get along, go along guy, uh, who actually said in 2019 that, quote, nothing would fundamentally change, unquote, if he was elected. So I don't see uh, Biden really rocking the boat in that regard. So I, therefore, I doubt that Biden will actually rejoin the nuclear, the nuclear accord. Um, and, uh, and, and another reason is that he'll be under intense pressure from Israel and the Saudis uh, to adopt a more militant stance uh, regarding, uh, especially regarding Syria, um, that the um, that Trump had sort of a, had a that was somewhat reluctant to, reluctant to get involved, tried to uh, lower ratchet down the uh, the um, the goal of uh, overthrowing Bashar al-Assad, and I'm sure that with uh, that with uh, Biden. Uh, the U.S. will return to the old uh, Hillary Clinton policies of maximum hostility to the uh, to the Damascus government. Uh, that's what I expect. We, there may be, be a few surprises, uh, but I doubt it. And finally, one nature, one statement of the uh, the, the class conflict, the, the class nature of Biden's victory. Um, it's very curious. We see a a, a striking uh, inversion in which. Um, the Republicans, to a degree, in a, in a strange sense, are, have emerged as the working class party, and the Democrats are now the party of the middle and upper classes. Uh, now, of course, that just shows the terrible things that happen when you have, don't have a workers' movement. Uh, and the only way that the working class can express its unhappiness uh, is through a sick and perverse uh, a uh, right-wing program of national uh, chauvinism, uh, 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 anti-democratic racism, uh, and a certain trend towards uh, towards uh, anti-democratic uh, populism, and a certain trend towards uh, towards racism. Uh, uh, that class division is more and more striking, uh, and. Um, we all know that Trump uh, captured more, a surprisingly large chunk of the Hispanic and the black vote. Uh, and so that could be the shape of US politics uh, in the coming years uh, with a uh, working class that's increasingly, uh, you know, uh, um, filled with these, uh, these, these, these right-wing populist uh, national chauvinist policies uh, in vain against a, a liberal middle and upper class. It's a really a, a horrifying prospect in terms of US politics, uh, but that's, um, that seems to be the way that things are shaping up. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll let Steve uh, jump in now and, and let him uh, give his take and, and, and uh, fill, in the fill in the blanks that I, that I left. Thank you very much, Dan. Okay, straight to Steve then. 
Okay, well, thanks uh, to all of you who are up uh, in, uh, in, in England. I, I think it's, uh, it is a, an important point in American history uh, that you have a rise of, of a fascist movement, a president who has actually exacerbated and encouraged fascist uh, tendencies in the United States. And you have a politically bankrupt trade union bureaucracy, which actually is responsible for Biden. They organized in the primaries to make sure that Biden was a candidate of the Democrats. Um, I think we have to look a little bit, you know, on the post-war period because the growth of the left in the United States, uh, when it was a mass movement in the 30s and 40s with general strikes and occupations, was led back into the Democratic Party by the Communist Party of the United States. And then the, uh, the Democratic Party and the right wing of the trading bureaucracy and the capitalist class organized uh, witch hunts in the United States to purge uh, the left communists, Trotskyists, and others out of the trade union movement. So you have in the AFL-CIO, from the formation of the AFL-CIO in 1954, a pro-capitalist, pro-imperialist, and pro-Zionist trade union bureaucracy in the United States. They are still in charge in the United States, this union bureaucracy. And they organize to prevent any political development, any labor party development, any working class development. So that is uh, why there is a, a, an important reason there's a political vacuum in the United States is because of the role of the trade union bureaucracy in the United States, even though the unions, of course, don't represent the majority of workers in the United States, but they do uh, represent important forces. The SEIU in this last election cycle spent $150 million uh, supporting the Democrats, yet they prevent democratic discussion, debate in their own membership and uh, actually are corrupt in the way they operate the SEIU. So corruption, is not in only in the capitalist class, but in the trade union movement in the United States among the bureaucracy, not the rank and file of the bureaucracy, which we have to look at politically. Now, I think we have to see also that in the post-war period, why the rise of Trump? Well, Trump is a reflection of what's happened in the United States with US capitalism, the deindustrialization, uh, the support for deregulation. Uh, Jimmy Carter supported deregulation of the airlines, continued by the Republicans, privatization, uh, outsourcing of jobs in the United States to Mexico and, and to Asia. This was done under Clinton, under the Democrats and Republicans. It's a joint policy of the Democrats and Republicans. And of course, Trump re uh, used that politically in his election campaign, attacking the Democrats uh, and uh, Biden for supporting NAFTA. And he was right. Of course, the USMCA, this new agreement, is an extension of uh, NAFTA. And uh, of course, uh, it was supported by not just Trump, but by the Democratic leadership. Nancy Pelosi and the AFL-CIO supported USMCA, which is a anti-working class agreement, corporate agreement that privatizes industry in Mexico, continues the privatization and deregulation uh, of, the, of the US, Canadian and Mexican economy. So this backlash, that has risen in the United States with this economic decline and economic crisis is a direct, uh, the, the Trump is a direct result of that. Uh, there is no left, I mean, the, there is uh, not a left alternative. There's not a working class political alternative. So that's what we have, a growth of fascism and a hope that Biden will bring things together, which I think is uh, illusionary. Biden actually is gonna deepen the crisis like Trump deepened the crisis because the neo, uh, you know, uh, capitalist policies, neoliberal policies of Biden are going to continue. Biden's uh, supported uh, privatization. Biden has supported, uh, continues to support deregulation. He wants to bring Republicans in his cabinet, which is going to infuriate those left people in the Democratic Party who supported Biden. But that is what Biden is. Biden is a, uh, was a racist. He supported uh, racial policies against blacks, uh, even though he has a black uh, vice presidential candidate. He continues to support the police. In fact, he says he wants more funding for the police, which is going to agitate and anger uh, the black uh, working class in the United States. So um, what uh, the business unionism, the, the, the crisis of business unionism is that they aren't able to get anything for workers. Workers are taking concessions. Uh, and I think what we look at now uh, is the rise of social democracy and uh, Sanders uh, is, is important because that's a uh, a reaction uh, to uh, the open pro-capitalist policies of, of the Democratic Party. Um, and Sanders, as a matter of fact, when he was running in San Francisco, called for a workers' government and a political revolution. 
in the United States. But of course, you can't have a political revolution in the United States without a social revolution, without an economic revolution. But Sanders basically sees the path forward in the United States through the Democratic Party, not through a labor party. And there's a fight now in, the de in, in, in social democracy over that issue in the United States because one development in the United States has been the growth of the DSA. They have 100,000 members. It's the largest left organization in the United States. And they did not uh, vote to support Biden. And there are sections of the DSA who are for a labor party, uh, a workers party. Um, and that is gonna be an ongoing debate because as the Democrats continue to, to uh, uh, you know, implement capitalist policies, which they will, uh, it's gonna to lead to a reaction and anger more and more in the unions. So uh, the, uh, who, who, who is, who is uh, Kamala Harris? Well, San Francisco, Kamala Harris was uh, basically a protege of uh, Willie Brown, who was a corrupt black democratic politician. She ran for district attorney in San Francisco. Uh, she set up an environmental unit in San Francisco and ignored the corruption with the development of Hunters Point uh, Shipyard, which is a radioactive nuclear dump, which are building condos on. Uh, she covered up corruption uh, while she was, uh, so there were workers who were fired, whistleblowers who were fired while she was district attorney. She didn't do anything. Then she went on to be attorney general of California, covered up uh, the corruption of the Wells Fargo Bank. She refused to prosecute them. They set up 900,000 fake accounts. She, um, uh, Minucci, who's the uh, treasurer of, uh, of Trump's uh, cabinet, was stealing uh, houses illegally, doing mortgage funds. Her office said he should be pr prosecuted. She refused to prosecute Minucci, and he later gave her 100,000 contribution into her campaign. So we're talking about Kamala Harris, a thoroughly corrupt reactionary politician. She refused to defend blacks, Kevin Cooper, who's in prison, to, to support a DNA. Uh, to see whether or not he was guilty. So we're talking about a, you know, a corrupt uh, black politician uh, who was following the corporate agenda really and supporting uh, corporate capitalism and the Zionist. She's a big supporter of Zionist, Zionism and Israel. And that's another aspect of the Democratic Party and the trade union bureaucracy, hardcore supporters of Zionism in the United States. Uh, if you, and they tried to say, if you're critical of Israel, uh, you're anti-Semitic. The same tactics that they've used in Britain against uh, Corbyn and, and those people who are critical of Israel. So uh, uh, now uh, I think that the, uh, the one role that uh, Trump played was to escalate the decline of US imperialism. And that's why the majority of capitalist class in the United States are angry with him. As a result of the isolationism uh, and the wrecking of these uh, uh, inter-imperialist agreements, uh, you have a uh, uh, a decline of the United States, and you have the rise, a greater rise of China, although they're trying to isolate them. And one of the roles of the Democratic Party is to continue uh, a, an imperialist drive against China and Russia. And I agree with Dan about uh, Trump going into Ukraine uh, and trying to rearm them. And uh, the militarization and drive towards imperialist war is what we're facing now by the Democratic Party, uh, as we did with, with Trump. And I think though that it flies in the face though of what is happening uh, in the United States because in the United States, the, uh, the economic crisis now and the anger, class hatred is growing in the United States. Uh, you have um, uh, hundreds of thousands of people living in tents. You have teachers who with the pandemic has exacerbated the contradictions of capitalism. I mean, it's increased the wealth of uh, uh, Uber, uh, of the uh, Amazon and the tech companies. Uh, and the middle class has been wiped out. The large sections of the middle class have been wiped out. Small businesses have been wiped out, which uh, is a danger for, for the rise of fascism and middle class people. So, and this is gonna grow. It's this uh, pandemic is gonna continue for a year, two years possibly. So what does this mean in the United States? It means a very dangerous situation for millions of people. It means the working class is gonna face continued attacks and you have a massive fiscal and uh, crisis because McConnell has refused to uh, support any financial support, which means that cities and states will be going bankrupt in the United States. Uh, the the uh, income of cities and states are going down. So you're gonna have the layoff uh, potentially of millions of public workers in the United States. The public worker unions, uh, SEIU, AFT, AFSCME have not united uh, all public workers unions against privatization against these attacks. So you've had a really a demobilization of the unions. There have been no mass labor demonstrations against Trump, against the right wing. 
And the reason is the trade union bureaucracy in the United States is terrified that if they start having mass worker demonstrations of 500,000, a million workers, they'll lose control of it politically. They'll lose control of, the, of this workers' uh, uh, protest against the attacks that they face. So their role has been, let's rely on the elections. Let's rely on Biden uh, to solve this crisis, which I think is, uh, uh, is not going to happen, obviously. So the, uh, the issue of uh, one important issue during the election and the threat of Trump to ignore the results of the election were some labor councils uh, with the DSA and others uh, called for a general strike. Uh, the Rochester Labor Council, uh, Southeast uh, Wisconsin, the Madison Labor Council, Seattle Labor Council said that the workers in the United States should prepare uh, with a general strike if uh, Trump uh, tried to uh, ignore or um, uh, fight the results of the election. So I doubt that Trump is going to do that. One of the things that's happened is the FBI, the state apparatus has come down on right wingers. They some right-wingers fascists tried to kidnap the governor of uh, Michigan. And, uh, and there's a network of right-wing terrorist groups and they, they arrested them and they went after them. Also, Biden's bus was uh, cornered and attacked by uh, some right-wing Trumpers in Texas. And I believe the FBI went after them. So Trump in a way has lost control of the FBI, the state apparatus and the majority of capitalists in the United States do not want civil war. Uh, the, the problem, one of the problems that capitalist class have in the United States is there's a large black working class, there's a large Latino working class, which has been mobilized, uh, and many have supported uh, 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 the, uh, the Democrats, um, and a war, a civil war, a confrontation with the right wing means the radicalization of the black and Latino working class in the United States, and that's a very dangerous thing for the capitalist class, and it was during the 60s. So I think you see a, uh, a fear of the majority of capitalist class of what a civil war situation would mean in the United States. So what tactics do we in the United States have to have? I think what we need is a united front for a labor party. We have to win over workers in the United States to begin pushing for a labor party, have labor slates and fight the corporate, corporate business ideology of the trade union bureaucracy who say that we can defend ourselves in the Democratic Party. So we have to have a a united front for a, a labor party. And we have to support mobilization of the working class, independent mobilizations, uh, if there's a threat to workers uh, with a general strike. And I think the best thing that could happen as far as that is Trump saying he's gonna stay in the White House, go in his bunker and try to rally his forces. At this point, <coughs> I don't see him being successful in doing that. That's a very dangerous tactic. And I don't think, I think right now what's happening is the Republicans, Fox News are falling in line with Biden and say, well, there's gonna be gridlock anyway. Uh, the Democrats aren't gonna be able to do anything. So it's better to go with Biden. So that is the, is the likelihood. Um, the, the, the situation of the left is weak in the United States uh, other than the growth of social democracy. And I think that uh, that's uh, the idea of national health care, Medicare for all, uh, the idea of uh, defense of public services, uh, it, it has tremendous support in the working class. But one of the reasons of the rise of the fascist and 70 million people who voted for Trump is there is no working class alternative in the United States. Trump is a populist, demagogue, racist, xenophobia, and he plays to that. And unless there's a working class alternative, uh, these forces, working class forces, 70 million large number of workers uh, voted for Trump, including union workers. Uh, unless there's a working class alternative, uh, that will continue to be there, and that's a great danger. So I think that the we should not underestimate the danger of fascism, and we have to fight in the working class that there has to be a working class political alternative programmatically that can provide answers to the 70 million and the mass of workers in this country. The last thing about is imperialist war, because although you can talk about a war uh, in, in other places, right now to have another war uh, with the financial situation in the United States was overextended, which is dollar is under attack, is very dangerous because the class hatred and anger could quickly go against the Democrats and the capitalists who would be pushing a war. And that is a fear that the capitalists must have uh, because the anger and frustration of the working class could quickly turn into an anger against the capitalist class for any war that the imperialists uh, move towards in, in right now. In other words, a war uh, imperialist war is not going to solve the problems, the structural problems 
of working class in the United States and the economic, deep economic crisis that we have, uh, including this pandemic crisis, the climate crisis, uh, the hurricanes, the uh, fires that we've had in California. These are uh, catastrophic conditions uh, for our uh, climate and the people of the United States and the world. And these are gonna grow, they're not gonna go away. So the idea of having a war in the midst of this is very dangerous uh, uh, ploy by the capitalists. They might do it, but I think it could backfire on them. So I think um, uh, we'll, one of the things uh, socialists have to do and the Labor Party has to do is to fight against war, uh, imperialist war against attacking China and Russia and has to go after these capitalists about the $750 billion a year that is spent for war around the world, the 800 bases. We have to make that a political issue. Why is the United States spending 750 billion a year on war when people in this country are dying in the streets, can't get health care, can't have proper public education, you have privatization of education with charters and that kind of thing. So I think that the conditions are uh, gonna deepen and I don't think Biden can solve any of these problems and he's locked in in the political situation with the Republicans uh, still having a great deal of control uh, in the uh, in the Congress. Thank you very much, Steve. Before we um, open up, can I just ask you quickly? Um, you're you're a member of the United Front Committee for a Labour Party. How is that different or connected to the Democratic uh, Socialists uh, DSA in the U.S.? Uh, are you working with them, or what? What's the well, story? We, we are working with members uh, of the DSA on the on the on the support for a Labour Party. So. We see working with people in the DSA, other trade unions, for a labor party. And uh, uh, that, uh, so, and there's, as I said earlier, there is a current inside the DSA for a labor party, for a workers' party. And we want to work with those and others inside the DSA, outside the DSA. And we want to work in our unions. I'm in the CWA uh, uh, journalist union, and we want to fight in the unions to form a caucus in unions for a labor party that support the idea of a labor party. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Tony first, please. Tony, you're muted, sorry. Yes, I was gonna say both of those contributions are incredibly interesting. Uh, I'm not quite sure why Steve wants to form a, a Labour Party in America since our experiences in Britain haven't exactly been wholly positive. I speak as an expelled member, but some of us would quite like to see a socialist party created instead of the Labour Party here, but maybe you have to go through the experience before you can come to our position, as it were. <laughs> uh, however, uh, I wanted to, I mean, the first, because I think both speakers, aren't you? Uh, the first speaker uh, mentioned the possibility of the Republican state Senate actually overturning the election results as a possibility. Uh, and Trump, of course, is trying to use the courts to overthrow uh, the verdict of the electorate. I mean, it seems to me that the US is heading towards some kind of constitutional crisis. Trump has uh, ensured that the Supreme Court will effectively block any radical agenda from the Democrats. E even Obamacare, uh, I, I think, is in doubt. Uh, we have a Senate which is wholly undemocratic anyway. Given the impediments there are to actually any form of social progress, even from the Democrats, what what do you think the possibilities are that the, the US Constitution in the end is going to break down? For example, if the, if the Supreme Court was tempted to actually overthrow the election, if they were to uphold the allegations of corruption or indeed uh, local uh, state senates. I'm going to bring I'm going to ask a few people first and then I'm going to bring the speakers back in unless you feel really urgently then message me or something then I can bring you in but I think it's there's loads of people want to speak which is which is fantastic but we have to going to be a, to be a bit um, sharper okay Suzanne please okay hi hi can you hear me yeah all good oh okay uh, just once, can you turn it off? Just turn it off, leave it in. Yeah, sorry, I'm cooking something, sorry. <laughs> um, so I, I'm just uh, 
wondering how what what possibilities i mean america's got uh, probably a worse first pass the post system than even we have here in the uk and i, I was just wondering if the um the, the, if the dsa were i know that there's dialogue within the dsa itself to, to split, to do a clean split or a dirty, dirty break or to stay aligned with the Democratic Party, your idea of a workers party. Um, is, is it just there? Are those parties there just to just to put almost extra parliamentary um, pressure on 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 the Democrats to, you know, to do something mitigate some of the, the evils that they're going to do or is there a possibility that that there's th that that they could ever make some kind of a breakthrough that's my question thank you suzanne um lewis please hello can you hear me yep all good yeah um thanks for the two speakers it's uh, really interesting to hear you know, uh, good analysis of all the different sides of what a Biden uh, presidency will uh, look like. But um, my question is kind of about the remnants of what, like, well, two things. It's kind of like what, what the remnants of what Trump has brought upon, upon um, America. So, you know, uh, the three percenters, the Proud Boys, um, you know, the Boogaloo Boys, and then the QAnon conspiracy following um you know I, I i it's one of these things that's always threatened that there will be violence and we've obviously seen um people have violent outbreaks recently during um some of the riots you know there was the shooting in kenosha i think it is um and then uh, so I, i'm kind of curious how the speakers feel about what's going to happen there is it going to calm down or is there going to be a surge of violence or what because you know, that's, that is the threat that Trump's kind of put forward. And then my last question, or my next question is, is like, you know, a lot of people have been talking about the DSA and, um, you know, and the, what, what, what the future is for the DSA and the other progressive candidates in the Democratic Party, because I know there was successful primaries, um, you know, last year or this year, and they brought forward a lot of great candidates, um, like Cory Bush, who won in Missouri, um, and then you have like uh, the down ballot uh, victories in Florida, even for fifteen dollar wage, and you even saw the Fox Fox News poll about wanting a public option or public well public health care. Really, um, I think it was framed as you know. So I'm curious about how the speakers feel about those two issues, but um, I'm, I'm very curious about the kind of the far right violence side because unlike. Um, you know, Western Europe, America obviously has that militia culture already there. And then when you combine that with the Proud Boys who've, who've already been carrying out violence and a few other, um, you know, uh, solo acts of violence, but the, you know, the school shootings and things like that there, I'm, I'm very worried about that, but what that means, especially with Trump being so cut loose right now by his own establishment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next one, Anne and then Jonathan. Hello. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much. Um, those contributions. Ooh, hold your camera still. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Is that better? All right. Okay. So basically, um, I just wanted to thank the two speakers. I think there's just so much to say, um, but they did make like uh, very very good points. Um, firstly, like I just really want to ask. Uh, I suppose this is more to Daniel or maybe to both speakers about the issue of there being like a united Republican Party, because as I understood it, there are many Republicans who didn't want Trump. And, you know, I mean, I remember all of the talk about impeachment and the unhappiness of the more kind of mainstream uh, Republican Party being against Trump. So that's just one question, like how effective would the would the uh, Republican Party be in relation to opposing Biden um, because of, you know, its own internal problems. Um, the second thing I wanted to ask about is uh, the polarization of the working class. And um, like, because it's been, I mean, it's more or less split, you know, just kind of like 51% Biden, isn't it? Not much more than that. There's a huge section of the 
uh, American working class, Latino, um, white, and perhaps some black sections of the working class, although perhaps not them, I'm not sure, but certainly Latino and white working class who voted for Trump. And there are large sections of the United States which were, you know, overwhelmingly for Trump. Um, it seems like, you know, that, 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 that voice is a voice of, in some senses, you could say desperation because they voted for Trump, like on the idea that he's like an outsider, but obviously nothing could be further from the truth, but because he posed himself in that way, you know, people have got illusions in him and it shows the deep unpopularity of the mainstream um, uh, Democrats. Um, and that obviously is something that's gonna continue. Um, in terms of international questions, I mean, I think that the most dangerous thing we've seen um, at the latter part of the last century and then this century has been interventionist wars uh, led by the United States on the basis of the United States bringing modernity or progressive politics to places like Afghanistan, Iraq, you name them. Um, and I think that the problem with Trump obviously was that he wasn't able to get the support that he needed and he wasn't able to win the um, international bourgeoisie to his side. So. He is obviously very reluctant to do more than just kind of, you know, uh, engage in hyper hyperbole in relation to um, attacks. Um, and then just finally, sorry for taking so much time. Um, I just wanted to ask really about the situation in relation to the left. I think somebody has put on the, the chat column that the um, right wing of the Democrats or the, the mainstream uh, wing of the Democrats have come out and attacked uh, the squad and the DSA for uh, undermining Biden's uh, vote. And I wondered whether you think that there will kind of inevitably need to be some kind of split from the Democrats, uh, given that there may very well be um, a witch hunt against those uh, people who were like, you know, obviously uh, some of them were voting for Trump, some of them were not voting for Trump, I'm sorry, voting for Biden, uh, the, the, the Saunders, you know, Saunders are bust people. Um, so anyway, that's a lot of questions I know. And uh, thank you very much again. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan, please. Can you hear me? Yep. So, well, well, thank you very much to Comrade Stephen, Comrade Dan for coming tonight. Uh, uh, you're most welcome hit back here at any time, as far as I'm concerned. The thing is that, that the Democrats have uh, treated the symptoms of Trump, but they have made no attempt to treat the causes. And I, I, I've already noticed on, on, on the comments section on uh, on Jacobin um, website, on Jacobin articles on uh, social media, that, that that liberals have now very much <clears throat> switched sides uh, to a bit. bit well, first of all, that well, for the last four years that they've been very anti-Trump, but now they're very pro-Biden, and, and will try and will shout down any anyone who's who speaks out against uh, President Biden and accuse them of taking the side of, of the Trumpists and all the rest of them. So from now on, uh, j just like uh, I, I for one have discovered to my detriment over the last five years, liberals cannot be relied upon to fight the status quo. My question is: is that uh, would you agree that? Building a Labour Party in America would be putting the cart before the horse, and actually, what needs to happen is mass uh, extra parliamentary, extra congressional struggle in bringing together uh, uh, the the black working class, the Latino working class, the white working class, Black Lives Matter, and the tenants uh, and the student movements, and also build a mass movement to bring up bring about the. Um, the changes that, that the United States needs. Thank you. I suggest there's a lot of questions now that uh, maybe the two speakers come in and answer a few of them. Um, also, I think there are a lot of questions about the Labour Party and how we're organised, etc. So actually a little bit of um, maybe an explanation how the Democrats work as well would be useful. I think it's not like our Labour Party, is it? They're no real branches that you can get involved in or can overturn policies or something like that. So um, I'm bringing in Dan first. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, respond to Tony's, uh, responding to Tony's uh, question. Um, you're exactly right. I mean, America faces a, an immense constitutional crisis. Uh, the US Constitution dates from 1787. 
Uh, and it's actually more change, it's growing more rigid and change averse with time uh, as it gets older uh, than it was originally. Um, so this is a recipe for disaster. I mean, a, an 18th century constitution, which is more change averse, uh, the older it gets, uh, is gonna lead to, a, to, to an immense structural crisis. And, and really that crisis is upon us. Uh, um, I, I don't know what Trump is going to do. Uh, when I saw him, I think it was on Thursday night, he was extremely adamant, quite militant, showed no signs whatsoever of, uh, of compromising, of, of backing down, of accepting the election results. Uh, I have no idea what he has up his uh, sleeve, but this uh, Trump has shown one thing, is that he's a, he is a fighter, he's not to be underestimated. Uh, so I don't know the next few days or weeks hold, uh, but I think the US is in the, immense of an, in the middle of an immense structural crisis we have divided government. We have a, a Senate, which is a, a extraordinary reactionary. 54% uh, of, of the country lives in just 10 states. So they are voted four to one in the Senate by the minority that lives in the, in the, uh, in the remainder of the other 40. Uh, we have a Supreme Court, which is all powerful and its justices are appointed for life, which means that uh, Amy Coney Barrett uh, the uh, the ultra rightist just appointed by Trump could be uh, could be ruling um, uh, could be handing down judgments well into the 2060s, 70s, or even conceivably the 2080s. Uh, so um so uh, it's an extraordinarily undemocratic system. It's an 18th century system which has somehow survived to the 21st century. Uh, and it is, a, uh, it is a, a perfect framework for a growing oligarchy uh, and, and a uh, and growing uh, economic polarization. So I expect the attacks on the working class to, uh, to uh, continue under, under Biden and to actually intensify. Uh, and as for Trump, I really don't know what he's going to do. I can't expect, I don't expect him to go gently, uh, but I don't know what he can do at this point. So we will see. Um, uh, uh, Steve, do you want to do you want to jump in and uh, and and add something there? Or? Well, I mean, I think uh, the, uh, the there is a danger, as I said earlier, of a rise of, of fascism, fascist forces in the United States. The crisis, the economic social crisis, is not going away, and the Democrats cannot solve this crisis. They don't have a program. They don't have a solution. I don't believe that the left-wing uh, forces in the Democrats are gonna be successful. The left uh, forces are growing. And yet you, the other situation is that you have California, New York, democratic states controlled, and they're, car they're carrying out uh, capitalist policies. They're carrying out austerity. They're ca carrying out budget cuts. So this is gonna lead to a further radicalization of workers and an opportunity for a workers' party. Now, I don't see, uh, the Workers' Party as an electoral party alone. I think you have to fight for a Labor Party, a Workers' Party with a socialist program, and you have to say, we need direct action. We need general strikes. We need workers' movements. Now, the trade union bureaucracy are terrified in, for, of general strikes, as they are in Britain and other uh, countries. They're against general strikes. They're for class collaboration with the capitalists. And our view is that a Labor Party, a Workers' Party, should be in favor of general strikes. It should be in favor of mass mobilizations of the working class. Workers are not going to defend themselves in this situation by, uh, with the electoral politics. Voting Democrats is not going to solve the problems. And also, <laughs> this deepening economic crisis in the United States is going to raise the question, how is this going to be solved? Are the Democrats going to solve this? Uh, the, the Supreme Court, I think it's uh, large numbers of people recognize that the structure the institutional structure, the constitutional structure can't solve the problems in the United States. Uh, somebody said, like, let's reform the electoral college. You know, I, I you know, some had made calls for that. I mean, my view is, is that activists, militants, trade unionists, workers have to uh, not turn towards electoral politics, but, but towards the formation of a workers party, democratic workers party, and for mass action, mass mobilization. They're going to be struggles like airline workers, what are airline workers going to do? What are public workers going to do who face mass layoffs because of the fiscal crisis uh, and the lack of funding? What are they going to do? 
Uh, are they going to wait for the Democrats to solve their problem? Biden, I doubt that that's going to help them, uh, especially when you have McConnell in charge and the Republicans. There's going to have to be direct action, which I think the trade union bureaucracy is terrified of, because direct action and mobilization, politicalization of workers in the United States is a threat to their power. There is polarization. There is Trumpism in the working class. And you can't confront that with the Demo with, by, by the Democrats. The Democrats can't answer these political and programmatic questions. Um, and I, as I said, uh, the uh, uh, Biden's agenda is to bring the Republicans into the cabinet, is to work with the Republicans. And that is gonna lead to a further anger, frustration against the Democratic Party. In fact, it's gonna make it more difficult for the left-wing people, Ocasio and others, to continue to operate in the Democratic Party when you have Biden saying we should get together with the Republicans. That's gonna exacerbate and escalate the anger and frustration. Uh, as far as the fascists and right-wingers, I'm for unions organizing defense guards. The ILWU on the West Coast has done that in the past when their members have been threatened by Nazis. We have, the workers have to be organized and have to defend themselves against right-wing attacks in the unions. That's what workers should be doing. It, but the question is, is political education because they're not getting that with the present trade union bureaucracy. The present, present trade union bureaucracy says, our solution is getting Biden elected. Our solution is more Democrats. That's how we're gonna solve this social economic crisis, which is ludicrous. So Tina, how do you wanna handle this? Well, there's loads more questions. Yes, yeah, should, um, should I go? Should I go on to address some of the other questions, or? I'd like to, yes. Good. Sure. Yep. Thank you. Okay, uh, Suzanne um, uh, asked about prospects for a third party, and I guess uh, uh, Steve addressed himself to that as well. Um, uh, the American uh, two-party system is the oldest in the world uh, at this point. Uh, it dates from 1856 or 60, uh, and all attempts to uh, organize a third party have fallen flat. It's, it, that's simply a fact. Uh, and the reason is the constitutional impediments to, or, to a successful third party bid are essentially insurmountable. I mean, it's not only a first, a first past the post system like you have in Britain, but any kind of new party would have to essentially uh, win a plurality in uh, scores, if not hundreds, of congressional contests and the presidency simultaneously in order to make a breakthrough. And that is essentially impossible. So, uh, so there are, there's always talk about a third party and it always goes nowhere. Uh, and as long as you have this, this 18th century constitutional strangulation, uh, it will go nowhere. And this, this doddering old uh, uh, Republican uh, democratic duopoly will continue indefinitely until the whole thing just collapses in a giant heap. Um, uh, Oh, Lewis uh, asked about violence, uh, and I think it's a, that's a very serious uh, issue, obviously. Uh, the New York Times estimated that there are 20,000 armed members of, uh, of right-wing militias in the United States. Uh, that's a pretty good sizable chunk of people. Um, and uh, they are certainly capable of creating a murder and mayhem. We don't know what's going to happen. They're unpredictable. They are scattered in, in dozens of different groups. Uh, a few of the more prominent ones are the uh, Proud Boys, the Three Percenters, et cetera. Uh, they are, most of them are, are, white, uh, are white nationalist uh, groups, but there's also a, a black nationalist uh, um, uh, militia as well, which has gotten a lot of publicity uh, in, in recent months. Uh, but they are really a, a dangerous sign of what I would call the Weimarization of US politics, which I expect to continue. Uh, and I certainly agree that, that, that a, workers, a workers' guard, a workers' mobilization, mobilization will be uh, is essential to, uh, to defeat this. But the point is, is the, it's the breakdown in the U.S. political structure uh, and the ravages of capitalism, deindustrialization, et cetera, which is uh, contributing to the, uh, to the mushrooming of these groups. Um, uh, Anne uh, talked about whether the... Uh, uh, whether the, uh, the, the, the Republicans will be able to maintain discipline 
uh, uh, under a Biden administration and be able to uh, to, to block him. Uh, the the Republicans are the more are the more disciplined party at this point than the Democrats. They've actually held together very well uh, under Trump, uh, and uh, I would expect them that to continue in the next few years. I think they'll they'll be a formidable force. They will they will fight uh, Biden tooth and nail on every front, uh, and I expect them to be successful. But I have the little crystal ball, and half my predictions have been. My predictions have been have been as you know more often wrong than right, um, and uh, and Anne also talked about the unpopularity of the mainstream Democrats. This is absolutely absolutely true. I mean, people like uh, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, or uh, these are uh, Nancy Pelosi is the Speaker of the uh, the House, and Chuck Schumer is the um, is a leader of the of the Democratic minority in the Senate. These people are 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 loathed. They are they are classic bourgeois politicians who are very rich themselves and uh, are only concerned with the top one percent. Uh, they don't listen to their working class constituents. Constituents. They have nothing to say to them. Uh, they are widely hated. Uh, the only reason Biden did as well as he did is that is that Trump was hated even more. Um, and. Uh, uh, Jonathan uh, said, um, uh, uh, raised the issue of, of the, how the Democrats don't really uh, oppose Trump. Well, the Democrats don't oppose Trump because the Democrats created Trump. I mean, Trump arose out of the uh, out of the uh, the the incredibly uh, you know, failed policies of the uh, of the Biden uh, of the Obama Biden administration and the incredible frustrations that they they produced. Uh, so the Democrats, you know, feed co quite neatly into Trumpism, uh, and now that the, uh, the the Democrats want to turn the clock back to the to 2008 to 2016, I'm sure we'll see the same the same uh, uh, chemistry at work uh, over the next uh, over the next uh, couple of years. And finally, um, Jonathan also also wondered whether. Um, Rather than, than talking about a labor party, uh, American leftists should be uh, sort of uh, fighting for um, for extra parliamentary uh, radical protests in the streets. Uh, and um, I, I, I think it's a false dichotomy. I think that the, the Americans, American leftists should be pushing for structural train, change, the kind of structural change which is necessary in order to create a uh, to create an opening for a, uh, any kind of mass socialist movement. But at the same time, they should, of course, be uh, be backing, uh, you know, supporting and organizing uh, extra parliamentary protests uh, in the streets. And um, uh, I think that there's there's no reason why they can't press ahead uh, simultaneously on those two fronts. Thank you very much, Dan. Steve, um, I'm I'm very aware that you have to go soon. We have one person who's asked wants to ask you a particular question. Maybe you could come back then and answer that one as well. Is that okay? Okay, Ian, please. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, it's not that um, Dan won't have any insights on this on the American um, wide scale, but I just wanted to ask Steve, as someone with local knowledge about Kamala Harris, um, you already um, did a wee run through of some of her greatest hits as DA, I saw. Um, I don't know if that DNA one was the particular -ish case I remember vaguely, but vividly, if you like, of her arguing against um, somebody she knew to be innocent to get off death row, um, or if that was something else. Um, I know she beat the, probably the most left-wing incumbent in the whole country um, back in the 90s, um, Terence Hanlon, and the son of Henry Wallace's running mate to start her career as a so-called progressive prosecutor. And there's so many different horrible things that she did, obviously, Manukin and, and all the other things. But I just wanted as somebody with local knowledge of her, how you rate her as an opponent, really. Uh, do you think she's going to be sticking around for a long time on the national stage, running the country for up to 12 years, four under Biden, and then two terms of her own? Because um, I personally think if the left think, right, Trump's coming back, or somebody like him, maybe somebody like him but smarter in four years' time, so we all have to rally around the incumbents, which given Biden's age and health, will probably be Harris by then. Um, I'll just leave the pitch open to the far right, and she won't be running the country for, for 12 years anyway, because 
the Republicans and probably the Trumpists, maybe Trump himself, will be back. Um, so how do you assess her as an opponent for potentially primarying in a few years' time? I suppose that's my question in well, brief. Well, uh, see, a, a central question, in my view, is, is the role of the trade union bureaucracy. The AFL-CIO, the unions spent massive amounts of money supporting the Democrats. Without the uh, Democratic Party, the unions in Cal the Democratic without the unions, the Democrats in California would not have the force that they have. The SEIU has 750,000 members. They don't mobilize it politically. They don't educate it. So revolutionary socialists needs to be fighting in their unions for a political development against support for the Democratic Party. There has to be a political fight against the trade union bureaucracy, which perpetrates the Bidens. Biden was the candidate of the Democratic Party because of the trade unions in the United States. They organized to get workers to support uh, Biden against uh, Bernie Sanders. If you want to know about Biden, it's not you know the capitalists really who were in charge of putting Biden in, in, in office. It's a, it's a union bureaucracy which supports Biden in the right wing of the Democratic Party. Let's be, uh, as I said before, the AFL-CIO are pro-capitalist the leadership. They're pro-imperialist. They're never, they never say we have to shut down the military funding. They're pro-Zionist. They support Israel. This is the trade union bureaucracy. So there has to be a political struggle inside the unions against a, these, this ideology and against these policies. And as I said, in, in, in democratic states, the blue states, we have a two-thirds majority, super majority in our legislature in California. There's no effort by the unions to demand that Zuckerberg and the billionaires in California in the tech industry pay for this crisis. They're not demanding that there be a capital tax. They're not going after the billionaires. So they, they, don't, have a they don't have a class analysis. And in fact, if you talk about the unions, the union bureaucracy, they don't mention class. There is no class struggle. In fact, Bernie Sanders didn't talk about the class struggle. The social, he's a social Democrat. He didn't talk about the class struggle. He talked about reforming capitalism to make it better. That's what the social Democrats do. They want to make capitalism better in the framework of the system. Now, the impediment of the Constitution make it very difficult. The structure, it's organized by slaveholders who wanted to keep the Electoral College, who wanted to prevent the popular vote. So there are a lot of people angry about that. But changing that requires political education in the unions. And I think there are going to be major labor confrontations that may bring about a working class movement. We have to have a mass working class movement in the United States. And people ask, with the kind of economic conditions, ma mass unemployment, uh, millions being faced with eviction in the United States, uh, continued murders, uh, terror tactics against blacks, why isn't there a mass working class movement in the United States? Well, I think it is coming because uh, the, they can't avoid this confrontation of workers fighting to defend their rights. And uh, as I said before, uh, this movement for a general strike was getting a hearing uh, in many unions and the union bureaucracy are terrified of that because they don't want the politicalization of the working class to the left, which a general strike would do. It would politicize the mass of workers and bring in workers, not just uh, organized, but unorganized like the Amazon workers. Amazon and these companies threaten the Teamsters. They threaten uh, organized labor. Gig workers, and they just uh, this valid proposition 22 one in California, uh, 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 institutionalizes slave labor for, for these gig workers, for these Uber workers and others. This is, and it's not just these workers because this uh, gig economy is what the capitalists want to expand all over to regular jobs, regular public jobs, and regular permanent jobs that workers have. That's going to lead to an increasing uh, fight uh, in the working class to defend basic rights. And so I see that as a political possibility. The idea of a labor party, what kind of labor party? I don't, as a Trotskyist, I don't see a uh, reformist labor party. I, have a, I, I think we need to fight for a program of a labor party of a socialist program and, and tie that to uh, against the Democratic Party, which has a capitalist program. And I think that it has to be tied to the struggles that are going to be are going on in the working class to defend their rights, to defend the attacks, privatization, and the racist attacks uh, that are going on. The police uh, around the country and the uh, mil some sections of the military, but the police are in alignment in many places with these right-wing uh, fascists. 
And that's a great danger. They work together. In fact, the, there was a thing that video that the New York Times did on how the police of Kenosha work with this, this guy that killed these people and let him pass by. So there is a danger of a collaboration of police. The police are the only union, national union that supported Trump, the police, uh, the policemen's associations. So there's a fight against the police and black working class people have to take that up of defunding of the police. But you know, again, this crisis uh, of social crisis, this economic crisis is gonna deepen. It's not gonna go away and the Democrats cannot solve it. And actually the structure is gonna make it very difficult for the Democrats to do anything because of the political structure of the United States. But I'm gonna have to go. I have, the labor councils have called for a mass, a rally at uh, 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 the uh, plaza, uh, Harry Bridges Plaza, the head of the ILWU. So there's gonna be a labor rally today and we're gonna be streaming it. The other thing I wanted to say before I go is we need a labor channel, an international labor channel. And we've been fighting the unions for unions to start pr having programming, more programming. I mean, with Pacifica, we do a, a labor show. I do a labor show called Work Week, but we have to have an international labor channel where workers can get their stories and struggles out internationally. So the fight against privatization, the fight against union busting, the fight for workers' rights can go international with a global labor channel. And that's something that we need to unite with workers around the world in doing. So that's something I'm involved in. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, you also expressed an interest in our uh, forthcoming conference that we're starting to organize about um, defend free speech uh, on, on Israel-Palestine. So we're going to see each other again soon. And uh, yes, the, the media outlet by the left is, is, is shocking how bad we are of counter. Well, the, pandemic, the pandemic has forced people to use Zoom. Isn't it? Uh, workers, workers' unions meetings now are on Hello. Zoom. There can be international collaboration for the first time in history with Indeed. the internet. Workers around the world can unite together. They have to unite together and use these tools to communicate and build solidarity and education. So, and uh, I shall. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, Steve. Okay, the thank you, brothers and sisters. Solidarity. Really, really enjoyed having you and you, you and Dan complement each other or disagree with each other, which is always a good thing. Okay, very good. Thanks. Take care. Good luck with your demonstration. We're going to have a few more questions. I think, Dan, you're, you're able to stay a bit longer, aren't you? Okay, so I'm going to bring in Alan first. Oh, no, I just kicked him out. I'm going to bring in Matthew and I'm bringing in Alan next. Sorry, Alan. Hi, Hi Matthew. Matthew. Oh, I'm a, yeah, yeah. I'm a, I, you can hear me, yeah? I'm hoping. Um, yeah, I, I, I was, I'm, really impressed by the contributions i think it's been a good discussion um you know obviously we stand at a point as the, as the comrades have made it said of crisis uh, i mean trump in itself is almost a personification of it you know the, the fact that you know this guy who was a sort of um uh, almost a sort of second rate mobster from the uh, the, the innards of the new york real estate scene suddenly becomes president i mean that that shows you that the system is definitely breaking down that such a person can 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 rise to that that point, um, and clearly also you know as the, as the comrades have also pointed out, the you know the effort essentially of the, the U.S. ruling class itself feeling itself under under uh, under attack then said then attempts to unload its own crisis into the rest of the world by saying well you know you you guys can pay for us essentially that's that Trump's program America first, America first and you guys everybody else can pay for us. Um, you know, an, an attack on the re on the capitalist classes of the rest of the world. Never mind the working class. Um, I think the the, in, the other interesting point that, I, that, that that comrades haven't really brought up yet has been the the, the fact that we've seen a, a, a mass revolt on the streets in in the U.S. over a whole period. I mean, my, my daughter here has been on the, been in communication with, with folk in Portland. You know, most nights of the week. Um, you know, what these guys have been on the street. You know, since what was it? May was it not? Yeah, I mean, essentially, you've had six months of, of, of near permanent demonstrations and, and and confrontations with the police in various you know, which have involved you know thousands upon thousands of people, um, and and not just obviously not just black people, but also you know, it's been a, been a, been a, 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 uni a unity of the youth of the working class youth in particular uh, against this sort of police regime. Um, and what I was interested in is, is, is what the what the politics emerging from out of that is, 
is that what, what, what political discussion has there been has gone beyond, you know, anything that's gone beyond, you know, purely the demand to defund the police, but in terms of, you know, has that actually then fed into, you know, a, a deeper discussion in terms of the nature of the system and the need for, you know, an alternative to, 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 to capitalism in the US? Thanks. Thank you, Matthew. Sorry, Alan, I kicked you out by um, Alan and then Maria. Um, yeah, Mike, uh, I had some questions which were primarily actually for Steve, um, but maybe if there are other people here from the United States, they might be able to answer them. Um, and that's around um, the DSA and uh, the possible creation of a workers' party. Because although the DSA uh, last conference came out against a vote for Biden, um, a significant layer of the leadership of the most dominant caucus, Bread and Roses, inside the DSA came out and campaigned for a vote for Biden. Uh, people like Eric de Bonk and so on. Um, so the, the, the question is, now they're in a quite a difficult position, I would imagine that they've, their man uh, has got elected, uh, but as other people have rightly said, he is just a capitalist politician and he's uh, bound by the requirements of capital capital, which in this uh, period of deep recession, possibly depression, um, is going to be a tax on the working class. And internationally, as people say, he would be more uh, aggressive. Um, I would pose uh, in those terms that the threat of attack on the Chinese deformed worker state uh, will be uh, greatly increased. Um, but to what extent, for anyone here who has close connections to the DSA, um, do people think that there is the possibility of a split um, now that the good guy has got elected, but he is going to attack the working class? Could that be possibly reflected in the DSA? I think that Daniel makes a good point about the problems of um, creating an electoral third party, one that's focused on electoralism because of the huge barriers which are placed uh, in front of that in the United States. Um, once you get beyond anything above, above local council level. Um, so the likelihood is, is that as well as trying to win people to the idea of a separate workers' party, it would have to be a, uh, a workers' party which does not focus on electoralism. Personally, I think that also in the current um, epoch, epoch of ecological collapse that we are now living in, that it will have to be a party which takes on a revolutionary Marxist program. Um, there is simply not time to go as, um, I think Tony earlier joked about going through uh, the stage of a social democratic party. Um, so I don't know if anyone is here, probably Steve would have been the one most likely, but is anyone aware of any groupings in the DSA who would be able to combine that um, commitment to build um, a, class struggle based uh, workers party and anti-capitalist workers party along with um, not seeing uh, electoralism as a central uh, tactic. Thank you Alan. Uh, Maria please. Yes my question is for Dan. Um, do any of the scenarios change if the Democrats win the two Senate runoffs on January the 5th in Georgia, the Reverend Warnock, I forget the other name. And also Sanders today said he was going to put forward his agenda to the Senate. Is he being naive? Very short and sweet. Thank you, Maria. Okay, we have one more question. If anybody else has a question, please raise your hand because we're gonna bring in Dan afterwards to sum up. Anthony. I agree more on the nature of the political conjuncture with Steve uh, Robert and Daniel. Uh, and I think that's going to be a big upheaval to see him on the Black Lives Matter of abortion rights. You've seen the prayer of a general strike. There's 20 million people unemployed. And that's, and that's why the, the, main ruling, uh, the majority of the ruling class, not just the liberal capitalists that want Trump out, it's also the... Uh, but some of the conservative capitalists won out because it was stupid and finally been swept aside in a revolutionary upheaval. Uh, so that's what, uh, uh, but uh, don't assume that, uh, that they're going to play into your, uh, play into your hands totally. 
I mean, the reformist thing, you can get any, the capitalism can only be changed by partial things. Capital has to go as a system. But don't, uh, the ultra left go wrong and see they're not going to use every devious tactic in order to survive. What we fight for is a Labour Party that fights for a fundamental transformation of society, using electoral tactics, trade union struggles, mass action, and the fight to mobilize the workers to uh, get rid of capitalism through mass action. And um, a series of demands uh, 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 to, to uh, link, link that uh, struggle up to, uh, together. Uh, so uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Anthony. Okay, um, there's no more contributions, so I'm suggesting Dan can sum it up now. What what strikes me is a is amazing how how a country born from revolution could end up with such an undemocratic system that makes it impossible for the people to to have a say. That is the uh, that is the real that is the real question. Um, uh, let me say. Um, uh, someone asked what the politics, I forgot his name, what his name was, for the politics of Portland uh, and, um, and whether the protesters who have been, uh, who have been really out virtually every night for the last uh, uh, four or five months, uh, whether they are starting to question the uh, um, American society more, in a more fundamental way and question uh, capitalism as well. The answer, of course, is yes. Uh, these protests have created some, uh, some, some very deep, uh, you know, deep questioning, deep inquiries into the, uh, into the structure of, uh, of our society. Uh, they, are, um, they are looking at, at, at questions of capitalism. They're looking at, at why the U.S. has turned into such a, a, a fiercely conservative society. Um, but I don't want to exaggerate it either. Uh, these, um, the, the, these movements are ephemeral. They're scattered. Uh, they're they're fragmented. They uh, they really lack any kind of organizational cohesiveness, and so therefore the uh, the questioning tends to be sort of like you know uh, fleeting, episodic, etc. Um, uh, Amer the American left is uh, is extremely scattered. Uh, it is um, it it needs it needs deep work in order to be sort of turned into any kind of solid, uh, truly radical movement. Um, uh, Alan asked about the, the DSA and uh, the prospect of, a, of a, any kind of split. Um, the thing with the DSA is the DSA uh, is not a, has, has no, as I think one of the, um, uh, someone from Cosmonaut said in the, on a previous seminar, the DSA does not practice any kind of semblance of a democratic centralism. It is merely an agglomeration of groups, factions, et cetera, which adhere to some concept of socialism, but there is no common program. Uh, there's no, uh, there's no um, uh, unity and discipline. Uh, it's totally amorphous. So therefore a, a split, I mean, a split requires a degree of organization, uh, requires uh, you know, a, a, a organization that can be split. So when you have something as, a, as amorphous and amoeba-like as the DSA, uh, a split is kind of impossible, but yes, I think that certainly certain elements in the DSA will be like will be uh, are very unhappy with any kind of orientation to Biden. Uh, they will push for um, for strong opposition to Biden's policies, and uh, we'll see how the uh, the DSA responds to this uh, this new the new framework that Biden is uh, is ushering in. And um, uh, Alan also raised the question of electoralism. Uh, and um, uh, I'm not sure what, what you mean by electoralism. I mean, certainly the two-party system in the U.S. is beyond bankrupt. Um, and, uh, and there is simply no, uh, not, no options for any progressive change within the existing uh, political framework. Um, but however, I think that socialists should certainly be addressing the issue of structural change. Socialists should be campaigning against the Senate, against the Electoral College, against the uh, against the uh, Supreme Court, uh, and against the uh, presidentialism in general. I mean, socialists should be should be, should be critiquing uh, these basic structures of the U.S. polity. Uh, they should be attacking them. They should be pointing out how undemocratic they are, uh, how they 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 strangle politics in the cradle. Um, and they should be uh, fighting for, for 
real democratic ch change. I mean, uh, uh, both a February and an October revolution in a sense. I mean, America needs to have, needs a, it's a, uh, needs sweeping political change as, as well as it needs a, a sweeping social change. And exactly how those two will interact is unknown, but they are closely linked, obviously. Um, oh, uh, Maria talked about, asked about the uh, upcoming um, special elections uh, in early January in Georgia and whether that could shift the lineup of the, uh, of the, um, the Senate. Uh, I, the, I must say, I'm not really quite sure uh, how that'll work out. Uh, I would assume the Republicans will probably prevail in those contests, uh, but I can't know. I think the, uh, the, the, uh, I'd be uh, unlikely to think that the Democrats will be able to, to shift the Senate into a Democratic uh, cate uh, uh, category, but um, I could be wrong. I've been wrong many times before. Uh, now, oh, when Antony uh, uh, finally raised the issue of the importance of a kind of a unified approach, which strikes uh, uh, at, at, on all these different fronts simultaneously, uh, you know, uh, trade union struggles, uh, ecological struggles, um, uh, political struggle, struggles, and uh, struggles for structural change. And I, I heartily agree. Uh, I think the, uh, the essence of any kind of Marxist program is one which develops a unified critique a theory of everything when it comes to, uh, uh, to, any, to any nation, but the US especially, uh, which tries to show how the, uh, the economic crisis, the, uh, the environmental crisis, the racial crisis and the structural crisis are all uh, bound together. They're all uh, uh, at, you know, different facets of the same phenomenon. And yes, they, they, we, they, the left must develop a, a comprehensive unified critique, so. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That was really fascinating. I think it was it was quite good that you and uh, Steve disagreed on a few things. I was make for, for a better discussion. I think we'll be looking out for the Senate, the potential of the Senate overturning the Biden victory. That'd be interesting. That's, that's an interesting thing to know. But I totally agree with you. Uh, the uh, sweeping constitutional changes seem to be really uh, required in America, which is a country ripe for revolution and without America we can becoming free we can never be free so certainly international cooperation as suggested by by Steve uh, thanks to corona <laughs> thanks to zoom uh, being on everybody's computer is something we definitely have to expand on thank you very much for joining us Dan and uh, thank you all everybody in the audience and um, have a good evening bye 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 bye